Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> Imran did a very fine job of introducing the topic for me, so I don't have to actually go into a lot of detail on what the HIRA means. But um, kind of opening remarks based on what Imran was talking about is the DMP um, responsibilities are regulated in South Africa. So when it comes to commercial diving, HIRA and risks and occupational medicine and hazards are all regulated. When it comes to recreational diving, it becomes a very grey area. Now, according to the law, a diving, any person that runs a business becomes liable under the law to comply with occupational health and safety regulations. But because they're dealing with the public, they somehow have this opinion that that, that doesn't actually include them, and that's not the truth. So we, as Dan, we shouldn't actually need to run this program, but, but firstly because we know that most of the, the dive businesses are so focused on recreation, recreational divers and sport, they forget their legal responsibilities and they're unaware of them. And then secondly, we deal a lot with dive businesses that are not in South Africa. So Mozambique, um, Zanzibar, the East African islands, and clearly regulations there either don't exist, or, and Mornay can correct me, in Mozambique, where they spoke about bringing regulations in, they were going to be so onerous that it was almost impossible for a recreational diver to actually dive in, in Mozambique. So they, they really are not very well informed and Dan has stepped into this breach and tried to provide some guidance, some industry standards and some methodology um, to the dive operators that they, they can actually undertake their responsibilities under health and safety regulations. Okay. I'm just going to give a little bit of a repeat for those of you that don't know about Dan. Dan obviously is very involved in Sahuma and in, in uh, diving medicine in South Africa, and you can see your lanyards all got our, our name on it. But our mission is primarily to promote dive safety, and obviously when we do have injuries, to then reach out and actually provide assistance to the divers that uh, require, require our assistance, especially on the medical side. And to fulfill this mission, we've developed two distinct programs. The one of them, um, let me start with the one at the bottom, is a recompression chamber assistance program where we are reaching out once the diver has been injured and requires treatment, we want to make sure that they get effective treatment and that the facilities that are treating them understand what the safety requirements are and through our education program we have on an international basis, you remember my talk yesterday, managed to have a profound effect on improving the safety levels at the recompression chambers. And then we thought to extend that in the general concept of, of occupational medicine is don't wait until the accident's happened, let's see if we can avoid the accident from happening in the first place, which is really where the HIRA concept comes in. And that we do under a program in South Africa called the Dive Safety Partner Program. We partner with dive businesses and we try to work our way in with them to educate them and make them aware of the risks that, are, um, that, they, are, that they have in the workplace and that they're exposing not only their staff but also um, visitors and people um, that come from other areas to come watch what's happening as well as the, the recreational diver himself. The recompression chamber program I spoke um, pretty much at length about it yesterday and what that program really does is it has established minimum requirements that we know are based on the real hazards that exist at these places so we don't have a long checklist of 1600 different points as they might have in the United States. When they do a, an accreditation survey it's literally they check through 1600 different items to make sure that every facility has everything there. We focus on what they really do, what they really have at their facility, and then we identify the real risks at those, those chambers. And then they become what we call prefer, preferred providers. So we have a relationship with them as Dan, and we give education, support, technical input, guidance, and so on. And in return, we know that when our divers go there, they're likely to, to get a much better um, treatment as a result. The HIRA program is very similar to that, but now it's not the chamber we're working with, but the dive business. And again, the focus is now to try and prevent the injuries from happening in the first place. The process, by the time it has evolved over probably a period of about 10 years, and we're about into year three or four at the moment, hopefully we will have minimum requirements that are accepted by the industry. So we really have our minimum requirements, that's what we're using in our higher assessments, but we're hoping that they will eventually become um, the standard for recompression, uh, for, for remote we get rid of the R's now, for the, um, for the dive businesses and the dive operators and the dive charters and so on. And we call them our safety partners, because clearly we rely very much on them to do what they say they're going to do, and we can only do that through a partnership. It has to be a, a relationship of trust and mutual respect. And then if you put the two together, we basically are reaching out to everybody that we work with, and we call these our professional partners. So it's a partnership process. Okay, our, our strategy has always been never to be 
the policemen, never to be seen as the upholders of the law, but rather to be the educators, the encouragers, to make people aware and to empower them through that educational process. And we do it very much on a voluntary basis. We do never want to be seen as the policemen. And I'm going to, in a, when I get to the slide, I'll explain to you where we've had a slight offshoot of that in the United Arab Emirates, where they actually want to bring in a policing role, and we as Dan want to step back from that and rather let them do that themselves. So we rely very much on education and awareness, and then the, the, the actual business has to self-report and commit to complying themselves. To some extent, that's the wise way to do it. You leave the responsibility with the business and you don't then incur a liability because the moment you start to set minimum standards and require people to comply with those standards, you then incur a liability. And maybe just by way of a very real um, example for you, the, there's been a fair number of, of accidents to do with breathing air, um, specifically now looking at North America. And Paddy, the, the big um, diving association that does at, um, basically runs the, the courses to instruct recreational divers and give, gives them their certification, they had a requirement for any paddy business to test their air quality on a regular basis and they set the standards for those tests. And then they had a claim in the United States where a diver, I think it was carbon monoxide poisoning, the diver died and they sued the dive business and then they realized paddy had actually put those regulations in place and that the dive operator was actually meant to test there and they weren't doing it. So they went to paddy and they actually took paddy to court and the claim really was that if you put down the regulation, then you should police it and make sure that they're complying with it. Because if you, may, if you give them their, their renewal of their status, that means you should have checked that they're doing the air quality test. What did PADI do? They simply removed the requirement. They no longer mandate that a PADI dive center has to do regular air quality. And that's kind of the reverse way that things work. You try to help, and then you get, that gets used as a, as a stick to beat you with. So we are very careful as Dan to encourage, but to leave the responsibility with the dive business. What we're really trying to do, though, is make sure the dive businesses are aware of what the issues are and that they are prepared and equipped and they know what they're going to do in the case of an emergency. Often it's just talk and they do the dive briefing and they say this is what we do in an emergency, but they don't really have the equipment, they don't have the training, and they certainly have never actually practiced those procedures um, in, real, in real time. And then the HIRA program is really based to take to build on that platform of a dive business that is committed to safety, to take it one step further, to make them aware of what the hazards are, that they can prevent injuries from happening in the first place. And it, it's a philosophical stretch, and in some cases, kind of beating your head against the wall because it's very difficult to even get them to understand the requirement to buy equipment to, to treat a, an emergency. And here we are trying to make them aware of seeing the hazard before they actually have practical experience of a person being injured. And the, the way that we actually do this is through education awareness and what we call the HIRA program, which I'll give you a couple of slides on to explain to you how we implement that in a practical sense in the, um, in the recreational diving industry. And you can see at the bottom of it here, I know, this, I know I've sat at the back of the room, it's very difficult to see, but the, we are looking at preventing injuries to people as well as damage to equipment, and the people are, yes, the recreational diver, because that's the client to the dive business. If you injure your client, he's not going to come back to you, and you're going to develop a bad reputation. But in reality, when we do the higher assessments, those aren't the people at risk. The people at risk are the instructors and the staff working for the dive businesses that are actually have fallen out of the health and safety loop. There are regulations, the dive businesses don't know about the regulations and these people have been exposed to noise, as you heard from Imran, sunburn, exposure and a bunch of other things that they don't think about until they leave that business and then the injuries or the illnesses manifest later. Just a couple of, or just two slides on the, on the RCAP, the Recompression Chamber Assistance and Partnership Program. Um, Typically what we will engage with are either true remote recompression chambers, which is a very basic chamber sitting in a dive club somewhere on an island that is only used maybe two or three times in a year. We do engage with the military, and on the, on the right-hand side, my right, or your left, is a military chamber in the United Arab Emirates that actually wasn't even operational. They had the chamber, very nice chamber, they had the willingness, but Dan had to step in and actually run the training because their staff were not even trained to use the chamber, and we ran the training course for them at the beginning of last year. Um, let me get it right now. On your right is probably, I think, please correct me, Yatsik, probably the busiest diver treatment chamber in the world in terms of recreational diver treatments. Apart from Yatsik and maybe one or two others, anybody know where that is? Yeah, you can, you can hold it yourself. Anybody know? Egypt, yes, Sharm el-Sheikh. 
So that's Dr. Adel de Heer's old chamber. He now has a brand new house chamber, but I think this is still his baby where he actually prefers to, uh, to handle the treatments because it's all hands-on and he knows what he's doing. And then not only do we go out there and assess the chamber, but we also then run courses in terms of maintenance and safety to educate the staff that they can actually take better care of their equipment. And that's a list you can see right from, from A to Z, although one shouldn't really classify Zanzibar as a country, it's part of Tanzania, but it's just nice to talk about the A to Z of chambers around the world, and you can see a fairly good spread of 109 chambers that we've assessed over there. In um, the underlying principles of how we're reaching out and what we're doing with this, and I, my very first comment is a very important comment, and it's a thing that we really want the dive businesses to understand. We don't want to be seen as people enforcing compliance. We want to be seen as people that want to develop a relationship of mutual trust, respect and understanding with the dive business. You go a lot further that way than if they see you as the police because the moment they do that, then they don't tell the truth, they hide things from you and you cannot do your job. You can't actually make them aware because they're not going to show you where the hazards are. They won't share with you the accidents that have happened and they won't basically tell you the truth. So it's very much the same philosophy as we do with the chamber assessments. And what we're doing from our side is obviously providing guidance, information, not just doing the higher assessment, but following up afterwards, training them in terms of air quality testing or, or noise level measurement or whatever other hazards are, are, are in the workplace, and providing them with the resources they might not necessarily have. We call it an assessment, it's not an audit, and um, we have, people have approached us before to do audits and we've turned them down, we don't want to be seen as people trying to enforce compliance. All we really do is take a snapshot on the day that we're there, we see what is clearly visible and we discuss what we can see in terms of what the hazards are. The process is intended to make the dive business undertake this process themselves, but it's a very difficult thing to do and most of the time what happens is the dive business says, listen, please will you come back in two or three years time, see what we've done and tell us what else do you see that's um, a risk at the, at the, at the workplace. But Mona and I have encountered one or two people out there where they, within the first half an hour to an hour completely grasp what HIRA means and they then and it's wonderful to see them going in doing risk assessments of parts of their business and coming up with plans as to how they can address those risks and that's that's really rewarding for us to see that there are like-minded people out there that take this thing on board immediately. Okay and the aim obviously is to make diving safer, safer to prevent the accidents from happening in the first place. It's a, a, what we call a three-tiered strategy, and the hire really only comes in at the third tier. You can't really start talking to people about awareness of safety and, and occupational and, and um, risks in the workplace until they have some idea of their responsibilities, some preparedness, and at least a commitment to being able to deal with an emergency. So the first part is to make sure that they understand and I think most dive operators really do this pretty well. They brief their, their, their clients and they'll discuss the obvious risks to diving, what happens if a diver goes missing, um, getting in and out of the water, the, the obvious things. We have to then try and help them with the less obvious things a little bit later. Um, so <clears throat> they really need to already have a commit commitment towards preventing injuries and if they do have an injury that they have some means of actually addressing and minimizing the injury or at least getting the person to, to a place where they can be helped with. Then we require them obviously to have some form of training so they are aware that you can't just accept that you're safe but you actually need ongoing training to keep your staff aware of what the hazards are and how to deal with them. So your typical, we call them the dam courses, but the first aid courses, oxygen provider courses, lost diver, <coughs> rescue courses and so on, these are things that need to be ongoing with the dive business. And then when we see that that, that mentality is in place, then we can step in with a hire and actually start talking about primordial safety, in other words, prevention before it actually has happened. really important to, to re-emphasize that we're not talking about compliance, so we don't get in with the pre-guest pre out checklist and say, right, do they have the following? We go in and we look at what are the risks in the workplace that we can see. The reason for doing that is it is an incredibly powerful message when you can show a person, see the slip hazard here and they see the slip hazard or the trip hazard or whatever it happens to be and you talk them through it, you explain to them how they can mitigate that risk and then they take on the ownership of what, what that's about. When you're ticking boxes and say, do you check your air quality, do you do this, do you do that, they're going to give you a glib answer and you're really going to have no opportunity to educate them. So you need to find what the real risks are and discuss those with them and then the whole attitude towards what you're doing changes, they become enthusiastic, they want to know more, they ask a bunch of questions and that's once you've hooked them, you can really take them through the process. 
Um, I said right up in the beginning, we're trying to establish what we call the industry standard, not based on a particular country and the country's regulations, but what should apply to any dive business anywhere in the world. But having said that, we do have a section in our higher assessment where we talk about the local regulations. And one of the most common replies we get, and I've certainly known this on the chamber side, is, well, in my neighbour country, in Jamaica, we don't have such regulations. Actually, they do. The, the organisation that one, I, th I think you might have mentioned it, Jack, or somebody mentioned the ILO, the International Labour Organisation, has a website, and if you know how to surf that website, you will find that about 80 to 90 percent of the countries around the world have subscribed to the ILO, and to be able to subscribe to the ILO, you have to have certain regulations already in place in your country. The point is they're not well published, and the people in the country and are thinking of Cyprus now. Today, the answer we got was there are no such regulations, and we actually went back and showed them they actually have regulations for noise, general machinery regulations, things that are, they're not going to have the word diving on them. But as Iman was saying, they are under the equivalent of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Those regulations are in place and we can help them find them and educate them and that once they know what their responsibilities are, they can obviously comply with them. And again, my, uh, my platform that I use is not one of theory. We do this in practice. So I've got loads of practical experiences, you know, having been out there and seeing what happens. United States of America, very popular diving place down in Key, in Key Largo. We did, we did a high row, we did a chamber course and I did a, a high row over there and what did we find in terms of, I don't know, Cecilia was there with us the first time, but the second time when I went back to do the chamber course, we actually tested the air quality for them. Now the United States has very strict regulations on occupational health and safety. Their ambient carbon dioxide in the filling area where they draw the air to fill the, the cylinders that divers dive with was between 3,000 and 8,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Now, in a, in a, for those of you that don't know, when we compress air, when we compress air, we do not filter out the carbon dioxide. Whatever is in the environment <coughs> is going to go into the cylinder. Only if we know we have a problem will we then actively scrub out the carbon dioxide because it's a very expensive filtration technique to use. And the filters get used up quickly and so most filters and compressors are not fitted with a carbon dioxide absorbing capability. And here we have first world country with first world rules and regulations and they don't even bother to check. And then they just threw back at me that the paddy had this big fight and therefore it's no longer mandated. And so in the United States of America, the dive operators believe they are immune to having to do regular air quality testing because of the paddy fight. They, what they haven't done is gone and read the health and safety regulations which says they are and they have to and they are responsible for the quality of the air that they're compressing. So, all I'm saying to you is you have countries like Jamaica and other areas, you have countries like the United States of America, and the same mistakes are made in both. And one of, our, um, one of your graduates from your course um, actually did a study, a practical study, went around South Africa testing air quality, and actually our air quality came out pretty well. We actually do a pretty good job in South Africa without enforcing regulations, but through awareness, I think, and we've had our SABs, 019 out for, for a long time, so people are aware that there are, are requirements and most of them actually comply pretty well. Uh, he must have missed a couple of places because when we talk to the compressor manufacturers, they say that some of these guys change their, they know because they sell the filters. They change filters every five years and there's no ways in a high pressure compressor you're going to have a filter lasting that long. So he must have skipped a couple of, of bad ones here and there. Hello, we'll show. Then another very important part of any program, and I'd better watch the time because I can stand up here and talk for a long time, is to acknowledge the dive business. So don't just go there and we don't just go there and talk to them about it. We actually, once they actually comply and they take on this process, we then acknowledge them either through articles in the Alert Diver or we have a certification program where they get awarded a certificate. And what we try to do in South Africa is give them a status in the dive safety partner program of a platinum status. Once they have a HIRA and they comply with a HIRA, then they actually can achieve that status. And I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. But very important to acknowledge the effort of people. If you acknowledge and recognize what they're doing, they're then encouraged to go on and keep doing it. In terms of what you required, what we require of them is some basic equipment, some basic first aid oxygen um, on site so they can deal with the really obvious things. Really important, and this is the part where it starts to fall down, that they have procedures and plans in place and that they actually practice those things. That's normally the first failure. As I said yesterday, you saw from the hyperbaric facilities, if they do have an emergency procedure, they fail to actually practice it. And we have the same with dive businesses. 
and we require them to have active training programs. At least the instructors need to be in date um, in terms of most of the first aid programs that are available. And then we will go out and do an on-site higher assessment. Um, we don't go in with theory, we, go with, we actually look for the real issues and we discuss the real issues with them so we can get them on board as quickly as possible. And we do not go away and write a report and send it back to them and they suddenly get a big surprise when the report comes out. We actually debrief them on the day, we tell them the issues on the day, we allow them a chance to tell us, wait, 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 you didn't see everything, there was something else I should have shown you, so that they can, to some extent, feel that they've understood what the issues before the report comes out. And then we issue them a report so that they have it in writing and hopefully they can use that report to then remind themselves as to what they need to pay, pay attention to. And the outcomes of the, of the process are either that they pass, so we have no obvious health and safety concerns with them. That's fairly rare in the beginning, but it certainly becomes um, a reality after the, after the first higher assessment. Most of the time we'll give them a qualified report, meaning that we'll tell them these are the areas we're concerned about and these are our recommendations, but the only recommendations are for you. Perhaps you can find a better way of doing it, a more effective way of doing it, but please, we feel that your staff are being unnecessarily exposed to sunlight and you need to have some program with your staff members, not only to tell them to wear sunscreen or to wear clothing, but that you follow that up. And it's always the big fall down in any occupational health program, is we write rules about ear protection, but then we don't actually discipline our staff when they don't wear that ear protection. And the law says, if, he, if that staff member has hearing damage and he comes back to sue you for, for damage and you defend yourself by saying, but I told him to wear hearing protection, the counter will be, but I didn't do it and you did nothing about it. So you have to actively enforce what you say you're doing and we, they need to do the same with their diving instructors. And then in rare cases we'll have a non-acceptable non report. We'll basically say, listen, you really have a lot to learn, a lot that you need to do with your dive business, but we can't engage with you at this level because your dive business really doesn't meet any of the minimum industry standards. Fortunately, we really get to that level, but that is because we're doing this voluntarily and a really bad dive business is not going to ask Nan to come and assess their pretty poor uh, uh, facility. We're just hoping ultimately that the divers will come to expect this and when they walk into the dive business they can look up on the wall and see an air quality testing certificate, a DAN certificate of the HIRA program and then they'll know that they're actually at the right place in terms of safety for diving. Might sound a bit silly to you in South Africa but if you go to the Caribbean where we have lots of reports of carbon monoxide poisoning then it becomes a big issue. You want to make sure that you're diving. You don't know the area, you don't know what the medical um, support is if something happens to you. You want to be sure if you're a, an alert diver. <laughs> a diver that's aware of these issues, you should, be, you should be aware of what the hazards are and look for that certification and get a better feeling that the dive operator knows what they're doing. That's what we're hoping will become the driving force behind this. Okay, Imran gave us a, a very brief slide of this, but the, the high process is a process, starting at the bottom with the hazard identification. I'll just have a couple of slides on each of these. Then we go through the risk assessment. So we have the theory and then we need to find does it really manifest as a risk in the workplace. Then important to mitigate the risk and how do you actually go about reducing or removing that risk from, from, the, from the site. And equally important to make sure that if you've addressed the risk, has it had an effect. And so we want to measure these things to make sure that we've actually effectively removed the risk. And if not, then you want to go back, reassess the risk, reassess the mitigation and then continue with the process until you actually get it right. Hazard identification, as Iman said, those we're looking primarily at health issues, but not only health, also property, equipment. There's a lot of investment that goes in the diving businesses, and the dive businesses can understand investment. They can understand losing equipment. They tend to be less concerned about injury except for being sued, and that becomes a property issue. They don't want to lose their money, they're not so interested in the diver's health. But also, they've got health of their workers, and that's the area that we see in the dive industry around the world in the recreation driving industry, that the workers, the, the, the instructors, the people that fill the tanks, the people that carry heavy things around, those are the illnesses that manifest much, much later, but they get injured in the workplace at the diving business, and these are things that you can really address very effectively. Again, I don't want to repeat everything that Imran said, but we, those are the, typically the, group, the groups of hazards. It just makes it sometimes easier in your mind when you're preparing yourself as to what to look for, to understand where to look for the hazards. What we've done in our HIRA um, program is we've actually written out these things so that they prompt you while you're looking at the workplace. But we don't want our HIRA assessors to go out there with a clipboard. We want them to go out there with an open mind and to see what is there and actually address the real things, not the things that are on some form of a checklist. 
the re reality is after a higher, a higher assessment you'll have a long list of potential hazards and we want to obviously refine those and see which ones really present as risks in the workplace. Clearly many of them can be very insignificant and we want to have a reputation as Dan of not talking about the, bot the soft drink bottle on top of the cabinet as being a you know, serious reportable incident but you can make them aware of what you've seen there. And then in many cases we don't know what the hazard is, we don't know what the air quality levels are, what the noise levels are in the compressor room, so there's scope there to actually measure and to monitor and to define and see what those levels actually are. Then we go on to what I spoke to a little bit about yesterday in terms of the risk assessment. Those are very much, I think, the same, the same point as I discussed yesterday. But we are going to quantify then what the risk is to see if it is really something significant that needs to be addressed or whether the risk is of a very low value and we don't need to address it. And we can use the same measuring technique I spoke about yesterday, but I'll give you a little bit more detail on it now. When we're looking at things like the probability or the likelihood of this thing happening, of such an event happening. I'm going to give a practical example in a moment. I just want to talk through the scales that we, we sometimes can use. We don't always go into this depth, but when we come to, a, to a, an issue where there's some debate when the dive operator is not really convinced, then we can actually use a quantitative scale to indicate to them why we think this is important. And sometimes they like this, because when they're doing the risk assessment themselves, they can sit down and think, well, is this an issue, isn't it an issue? And then if you give them some steps to go through, they come out with the conclusion that actually it is something they need to address. So we use these typically qualitative uh, type questions, you know, is it very unlikely, is it absolutely definite to happen, and anywhere on that scale you'll come out with a number that you're going to use in your scoring system. And then, is there an exposure to this hazard? How often does that exposure happen? And is it very rare, less than once a day, or maybe once a week, or it's going to be continuous? Every single time the person's climbing up the ladder, it's possible that they can slip or fall or whatever the, the issue is we're looking at there. And then we need to define the consequence and is it really just noticeable, maybe some minor first aid, or is it going to lead to something catastrophic or something in between? And it's really easy when you're doing a risk assessment to use a scale like this because these are easy questions to actually get in your mind. And instinctively, the mind is actually pretty good. The instinctive answer about the, the, how serious the outcome is going to be is normally the most accurate um, estimate of what it is. And then we can apply these either in what I call two dimensions or three dimensions. Okay. Um, in the two-dimensional scale, we just look at the consequence and the likelihood or the probability, and you'll have a scale of one to five on both sides, and you'll simply see where you come out over there is a medium risk, a high risk, a critical area, or something that we can um, define as negligible. And I'm going to come back to an example, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. Or we can do it in three dimensions, looking at both the likelihood, the exposure, and the consequence, come out with a score, and then you'll have a risk level from the score. The problem with these things, and it was part of what we faced when I was doing the thesis, is this is a relative scale and very difficult to get absolute values. And let me show an example where we use both of these scales and we come out with a slightly different um, answer. And just give me one second to explain the slide. The whole HIRA program, although those of you involved in occupational medicine, this is nothing new, but the HIRA program for Dan came about in a very casual conversation at the wedding of one of our colleagues overseas, which is actually his daughter that is getting married, and the physician that treats the Dutch royal family came to speak to me about safety. He says, you talk about chambers, but I want to talk about something else. And he had, had just stitched up the royal prince's finger. He had put 18 stitches in his finger because of a stupid ladder injury. The guy was climbing up a ladder, up and down a ladder. The ladder obviously bends to cope with the swell on the boat, and there's a wonderful guillotine action there, and he'd actually cut his finger, not for the first time. This is now on the royal yacht, so not for the first time he cut his finger. Can't we make people aware of these hazards? So this is a good one to take as an example. So how likely is it to happen? Well, it's certainly not unlikely, and it's not going to be definite, but it's certainly possible. The consequence of that, um, look at the two-dimensional two scale here. So, well, it's at least it can be serious. It could be negligible. You can just hurt yourself. But most of the time when you get your finger caught in a, in a vice action and you've got 18 stitches, you'd call that fairly serious. Lots of blood. Lots of panic because it's the royal prince, and so it becomes a fairly serious um, outcome. On the two-dimensional scale, though, we only, only come out as a medium risk. So no one's going to lose their life, but we'll have to now decide, are we going to address this or aren't we going to address it? Have a look on the three-dimensional scale, though. So it's still possible. It's still a serious disruption. But you climb up that ladder every single time you come out of the dive. So now when you add that dimension onto it and you look at the scale, it says urgent attention. No longer medium risk, but this is a high risk and you need to actually address the risk. And I don't want to belabor the point, but it, one can get caught up in, in scoring and one doesn't always like to use scoring, but sometimes it is a very good educational tool 
to actually show them why you should be addressing it. Um, then after you've identified or, or assessed the risk, you're now going to look at your risk mitigation and a very brief slide for you to show you how one does that. Either you go and look at the source, where the source of the hazard is, and you might apply some technical or engineering controls, redesign the ladder, put barriers in place, or do something physical. If you can't do that, then you look at the interaction between people and that hazard, and there you'll typically put in some form of training, procedures, policies, something to make the people aware that they don't actually go and expose themselves. And if you can't prevent that from happening, then you're going to provide personal protection equipment or something to physically protect the diver or the person at work putting um, um, ear protectors on, because you can't stop the noise. The education is not good enough. In fact, it won't be effective. You physically have to go and protect the person. So those are the typical steps you go through in risk mitigation. And then finally, monitoring. Really what we're trying to do here is not measure for the sake of measuring, although some of the researchers might want us to do measuring because they want to see what the data looks like. But speaking of that, make sure that if you are measuring, you find some form of denominator that's common. So it's the number of people coming through your business, or the number of dives you do, or the number of tank fills, the number of boat launches, something that gives you a good thing to compare your incidents to. And also remember not only to record infringements, but also what we call near misses. It didn't lead to an accident, but it could have led to an accident, and that does qualify as a failure of the system. And then just finally, where we've actually applied this program, so I can try and keep on to time. Um, we've taken the program on board under international DAN, but obviously the individual DANs are doing this on an individual basis, but we share our database of information. We're trying to learn from each other. We're trying to get everybody onto the same program. At the moment, Dan Southern Africa and Dan Europe have been very active with it. Dan Japan, very excitingly, is now coming on board and they're coming back to South Africa later on this year for further training, so they're very enthusiastic about it. And believe it or not, for those of you that know some of the politics, even Dan Australia is coming on board and they are very keen to get involved in this, in the program. A couple of examples of reports around the world that we've done, and I'd just give me one second, Jonathan, to elaborate a bit on the UAE. This is in, um, in Dubai. There, the government controls every business. I'm, I'm just not going to the politics of the, of the United Arab Emirates, but the Sheikh will always have a share in every single business. And so they have rules and regulations coming out of every possible orifice. But they have a diving association, and they were looking for some means of qualifying a dive operator before they are allowed to open shop. And what they thought was an ideal way to do this would be a safety assessment. If they meet the minimum requirements, obviously they meet all the other financial requirements, then they would get a license, and the license would be um, periodically reviewed, and every time they review, they'd have a, a higher assessment. And as Dan, we were very happy to train them, but we were not happy to have Dan do those assessments, because that becomes a policing action. But we were very happy to train the assessors that they don't go out with a clipboard, but they actually go out as educators, educating these businesses, and making sure that they take the whole philosophy of accident prevention on board. So just another example of how one has to accommodate the different areas. Those are the typical, um, what we call the components of the high road. We look at the compressors, we look at the boat operations, we look at the dive shop. Some things that you wouldn't think about, the changing rooms, the storage rooms, the equipment room where they actually do the work, as well as the obvious things like putting divers in and out of the water. So the high road takes it way beyond the, the things that people traditionally focus on in a diving business and shows them that they're actually responsible even for the public coming into their dive shop. And then, just the last slide, um, the trick with something like HIRE is it's fairly sophisticated and trying to get people on board, you need to keep them encouraged, you need to recognize them, and you need to, we need to build it into a program called the Diving Safety Partner Program. The UAE wants to build it into a policing program, but you need what we call a framework, something that you can establish with the dive operators, they feel the need to actually come on board and stay on board and actually um, improve the, the safety culture in their, in their um, businesses. Clearly you want to make sure that the assessors, the, dive, the higher assessors are properly trained and we do that as Dan, we train them, we expose them to several higher assessments, we get them to write the reports, we help them through the reports and then obviously they get to a point where they become competent enough to actually do it. And we will continuously fine tune the system but hopefully by the sort of time that about 10 years has come and passed we would like to be able to, con um, to regard the higher report as being what we would call the minimum industry standards for dive businesses, that if they comply with those, we should have a fairly good level of confidence, a high level of confidence that we're going to be avoiding many of the accidents that we see presented today. Not the DCS and the, the, the in-water injuries, but more the occupation type injuries, the slips, the trips, and the things that happen you know, way away from the dive site. Okay, well thank you for your time. Any questions you have?
front. So I think that's uh, that's tremendous value to uh, diving in general in South Africa. Just uh, perhaps a question: the majority of uh, dive operations in South Africa have they? Ask for an evaluation. Do you have an idea of the percentage buying? We have. Uh, can I grab this? <coughs> At this stage, we, we have the limitation is actually on the assessment. So we actually do them. We respond to them, and there've been some very enthusiastic people, and some of them had one and actually want another one. We in the process of actually educating the public, and the Dan Divers Day, we'll be having four of them this year, is where we're actually going to launch this more into the public domain. So we've held back a little bit, and we've been selective, and we've spoken on a case-by-case basis with the dive operators, so we can get our team of assessors trained up and our, our procedures running smoothly. But we're, this year we will actually be launching it at the four Dan Divers Day, so that the dive operators can see it on a more public uh, basis.